All right, everybody, jumped ahead a little bit. I may uh, swing back around later on and pick up, uh, recapture the Philippines and Iwo Jima. But today we're going to look at the Battle of Okinawa to the surrender. And when we last stopped talking, we were talking about Peleliu and how tenaciously the Japanese were fighting closer we got to the home islands. Well, the Battle of Okinawa will be the bloodiest, just like in Europe the month of January, right before we cross the Rhine, the war turns the bloodiest. So it is here. And while the battle for Iwo Jima is being raged in March, March 23rd um, through June 30th, um, a task force was being put together to finish the job in Okinawa. And Okinawa is the largest of the Rukuru Islands. It was at the edge of the Japanese home islands, considered part of mainland Japan. So they are going to fight tenaciously. This is the largest and the costliest battle in the Pacific theater. So Okinawa is chosen as a potential base as a staging area for the invasion of Japan in and of itself. So this one is going to be big. Um, here is Okinawa. We're going to land kind of right in the middle and then spread south and then go north. The last part to fall will be up here in the Motubu um, Peninsula. It's going to be a U.S. Army invasion. And the planning of it will be known as Operation Iceberg. The size and the scale of it would match the D-Day invasion of Europe a year earlier. It will be commanded by Rear Admiral Raymond Spruance, involving half a million men and 1,200 naval vessels. On the ground, American Lieutenant General Simon Bolivar Buckner is going to take two Marine and four Army divisions onto the island of Okinawa. On it will be 100,000 Japanese soldiers and 200,000 mostly conscripted Okinawan militiamen. Here is General Buckner, and here is some of the landing craft facing, heading into Okinawa. There's no real big bluffs on the beach like at D-Day, but it's close enough. So, Admiral Mark Mishner, Naval Admiral, is going to begin once again the traditional American naval and aerial bombardment on March 23rd. They're going to blow it to pieces. His opponent is going to be Japanese General Mitsuhuru Ushijima, very smart, capable Japanese commander. And Ushijima is going to decide against instructions given from high command. Do the same thing that they did in Iwo Jima. And he says, no, Okinawa has different terrain. It's too difficult to defend that way. So he chooses the hills, the hilly part of the terrain in the south to defend the heaviest, and more up in the mountains in the north. Not to fight in the flatlands. He's going to use geography to his advantage. As the Americans begin to divide their landing craft, here is where Americans really see the teeth of the kamikaze. Um, it is a myth that kamikaze were used throughout the war. You don't want to spend thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours training a pilot to blow themselves up. This is a last resort tactic where you taught guys how to take off and turn themselves into human bombs. This is what will begin to happen to the American landing craft. And this, as you can see, is, is the mountain. The approach is heavily mined. It's got machine gun nests and tunnels and barbed wire and tunnels dug, lacing throughout the mountain to artillery and machine gun strong points. This is just one of the mountains turned into a strong defensive position by Ustajima here. So the two smaller outlying islands will be attacked on March 23rd and on March 29th. The main attack is going to hit on April Fool's Day, April the 1st. And once again, there's little opposition. So the Marines and soldiers move inland 
And they're thinking, okay, we're making great gains and we get the key airfields. But this is where things are going to start to, um, uh, I guess, start sinking. The island has also been split. So the Marines move up to the Manobo Peninsula by April 20th. They're doing pretty good, they think, at first. Then all of a sudden, the Army divisions going south face a lot more difficult obstacles as the two forces are split. Number one, the rain hits, turning the soft, marshy swampland and rice paddies into quagmire. Here is a two-and-a-half-ton truck up to its fenders in mud. And when American mobility bogged down, the Japanese will come out with, once again, a powerful counterattack, almost like a bonsai charge. There's fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting on both sides of this operation, um, bayonets, entrenching tools, knives, and hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And then all of a sudden, the kamikaze pilots show up in force as the supply, the invasion fleet, will be attacked by kamikaze. 1,900 kamikazes attack, sinking 38 ships and damaging nearly 400, 368 more. The Japanese Navy also launches a suicide mission, and their newest, giant, biggest, baddest battleship, the Yamato, named for the Emperor's dynasty, tries to ram and sink American ships but it will be pounded by 380 American aircraft. It will take that much punishment before it sinks. It was a symbolic and dramatic ending to one of the most powerful navies of all time. So here is the um, Yamato, and here is once again the Enterprise, the Big E, taking hits from um, kamikaze pilots. By May 21st, you know, two months into the battle, resistance begins to weaken. Slowly but surely, American forces move forward. The capital is liberated, but Usajima will retreat to a tiny peninsula where the final battle is going to take place. Um, in the middle of this, an artillery shell lands right next to General Buckner, and he will disintegrate. He will be killed instantly. It's during the heavy rain of Okinawa that the Japanese began to put what we would call today a suicide vest, a bomb vest, on Okinawan citizens and have them run at American Marines and soldiers, figuring they would hesitate to shoot until the civilian got too close, then they would um, explode. Um, a month later, a month after um, General Buckner is killed, Usajima will commit suicide on June 22nd, signifying the end of a lot of the resistance there. Now, thousands of Japanese soldiers will leap from the, the mountains into the sea cliffs to commit suicide. One of the things the propaganda was spelled out at this time was that the American Marine had to kill and eat his parents in order to become a Marine. And Marines were shown with big horns coming through their helmet and bloody dripping like vampire fangs. From the um, Okinawa militia, out of that great number, 200,000, only 7,400 will survive. And every single Japanese soldier on the island of Okinawa will be killed in combat. The Americans are going to lose 12,520 men. We're going to lose another 36,000 wounded. And it was because of the high casualty rate on Okinawa, on Peleliu, on Iwo Jima that caused President Truman to decide not to attack the home islands. Here's a famous picture of this young girl, like shivering. American medics had to take bits of Hershey chocolate bar and leave like a Hansel and Gretel trail through the woods and when the kids would find the chocolate they would eat it and a medic would pop up out of the bushes and grab the kid. You can only imagine the tear that this young kid felt at hearing that these guys are going to eat me raw and the medics 
had to carry the kids kicking and screaming back into town to show the people they meant no harm and to give them medical treatment when the soldier is handing out rations and food to a small Okinawan um, villagers, the magical Hershey bar. But when parents began, um, some parents were throwing their children off the cliffs. When people began to stop doing that, Japanese snipers opened up on the Okinawan um, civilians. So brutal end to this battle. You can just see civilian, marine, soldier, it didn't matter. Um, Okinawa was just a complete and total war zone and blown to bits. Here's a mom and a little girl who had a suicide vest on them. And this is going deep into the mountains and the jungle, literally just flamethrowering everything to um, uh, root the Japanese out of there. And going into the end of the war, uh, civilians, um, casualties were estimated, American military, Japanese military, and civilian were estimated between two and five million should we land and invade the home islands. So the idea to drop the atomic bomb, it couldn't have been an easy decision, but it was the only decision President Truman could make. Two million casualties compared to several hundred thousand. So on August 6th and August 9th, 1945, two atomic bombs will be dropped. On June 30th, the famous ship, the USS Indianapolis, will deliver the atomic bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy, to the island of Tinian. The Indianapolis was on a secret mission. On its return trip, it was sunk by a Japanese destroyer, and the um, 1,200 men that went into the water, they were there for nearly eight days. About 800 of them will drown, die of exposure, or will be eaten by sharks. If you've seen the famous movie Jaws, Quit was supposedly on the USS Indianapolis, a great movie on Netflix about the um, Indianapolis. So here you have 500,000 to a million Americans, 2 to 5 million Japanese. So what are we going to do in Operation Olympic, the, the attack on the home islands? We had hoped the firebombing and the blockade, um, you know, mining the shores would make the Japanese quit, but it does not. So we're going to ratchet it up a notch. There's the famous USS Indianapolis right there. And so the Manhattan Project is dreamt up. In 1942, it was the code name for a secret group of scientists spread throughout the country to build the different atomic bombs. It was headed up by famous physicist scientist Robert Oppenheimer, an intellectual who was extremely bright. People knew from a young age there's something special about this guy. Over in Germany, he studied theoretical physics. This is your, like, Stephen Hawking type stuff. And he comes to the United States to teach at California Berkeley in the 1920s. Now, the physics necessary to understand the bomb was pioneered, just the thought process, in the early 30s. By 1939, it was a theoretical, not a practical possibility. So the scientists are going to work on this, and the problem lay in the production of a certain element. And the problem with this is other countries, especially England, did not recognize, did not recommend using plutonium, but instead enriching uranium. Something that, you know, Iran tried for years, that North Korea was trying for years um, to do. Um, but Great Britain didn't have the money, so the United States is going to take over. Oppenheimer will oversee a project that will cost in the 1940s $2 billion. This is in the 1940s. And require the efforts of 600,000 people. By the summer of 1945, there was enough enriched uranium-235 ready to make a few bombs. So this will all be done um, down in New Mexico at the Alamogordo Air Base, where the first atomic bomb is successfully detonated. The information is instantly relayed to President Truman, and Truman 
who is attending the Potsdam conference, um, will approve of the drops not only to end the war sooner, but also to back off the encroaching Soviet Union. And the city of Hiroshima was chosen because it had never been touched by Curtis LeMay's concept of firebombing. Now, after being briefed by a gentleman who lived here in Chapel Hill, James Miller Finkel, if you know the Miller Finkels, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, a one-time pilot of Dwight Eisenhower, um, will take off from the island of Tinian on August the 6th. He and his crew were told that they were just carrying a really big bomb, 8,800 pounds named Little Boy. The bombardier was North Carolina native Tom um, Furby, who's from Moxville. There's a great exhibit to him in the North Carolina Museum of History in the Call to Arms section. It is Furby who launched the bomb and then activated the video camera. And it is he, not um, Paul Tibbetts, who said, oh my God, what have we done? They really didn't know what this thing um, was. So here is um, Oppenheimer. This is... Um, Paul Tibbetts, and here is um, Furby um, getting ready um, to launch. The bombs that were dropped in Hiroshima, the people were on their way to work in the morning. It was rush hour. So when the bomb is detonated, it blows up five square miles and killed 120,000 people. Roughly 40% of the population of Hiroshima was instantly incinerated. And the Jap Japanese were immediately asked to surrender. And they, says, they said, no. And we're like, are you kidding me? They go, yeah, we are not going to surrender. Furby gives his great quote, oh my God, what have we done? And Oppenheimer goes down forever when he says, I have become death, the conqueror of worlds. All right, I am Thanos, or whatever in the modern, um, in the Infinity War. So there is the drop. And here will be the mushroom cloud as filmed by Paul Tibbetts and the Enola Gay. This is what Hiroshima looks like, just completely destroyed and blown apart in a five square mile area. All right. As a result, we decide to drop the second bomb, uh, Fat Man, on August 9th, 1945. And the primary target was the city of Kokura. But it was fogged in and clouded in, so the um, pilot of the boxcar, the second plane, was diverted to the alternate site, the city of Nagasaki. What a lot of people don't know is the main city of Nagasaki sits here, right in front of a volcano. Well, we dropped the bomb on purposely on the back side to shield most of the city from this destructive power. 74,000 people were killed and 74,000 were injured out of a population of 270,000. So when you look at the 190, uh, 200,000 casualties as a result of the atomic bombs, or more deaths rather, there were more casualties, it's a lot less than 2 to 5 million. The effect on Japan this time is more disbelief than terror. They thought, oh my God, these Americans have got a bunch of these things. What are we going to do? Emperor Hirohito was then asked to begin to decide on the issue of surrender. You're going to do this, cowboy, or here we go. Um, now, the Soviets um, had infiltrated the Manhattan Project. Um, they will eventually um, be caught, so to speak. And the effect of the bombs on the Soviets was not as intense as we'd hoped. We hoped it would scare them and back them off, but they were already stealing our um, technology. Um, Tom Furby would suffer nightmares for 20 years, and at the 20th anniversary in 1965, he was asked to go over and visit Japan, and, and you know, President. Johnson was going, former President Eisenhower was going, um, you know, President you know, Truman was going, and he says, no, what do I want to go for? And his wife says, maybe you should go. 
And the aiming point was going to be renamed the Truman Bridge, which forms an underpass and an overpass. Um, like a giant X marks the spot. When they landed in Tokyo, there was a big band, young children came up, and when Tom Furby was announced, an old grizzled man who was badly burnt came up and gave him a hug. And he's like, oh, oh my God, what's going on, on here? And the old man was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. He's like, what are you thanking me for? Look at you. I did that to you. And the old man said, don't worry about it. My, I have, my daughters are full grown and I have grandchildren. My two young daughters, you know, six and ten years old, were taken to the beaches and given four foot lengths of bamboo. When you Marines came ashore, they were going to take those bamboo and stick you guys with it, knowing that American Marines would hesitate to fire on women and little children. But once upon seeing their buddies get shish kebab, you know, Marines would have just laid waste to everything. So you saved my family, you saved my daughters, don't worry about me, thank you. And that allowed to get Tom Furby some aspect of um, peace. This guy, Mr. Yamaguchi, is a legend. He was a young man and was on the outer ring of the bombing of Hiroshima. Because he suffered radiation burns, he was taken to a special hospital that specialized in burns in Nagasaki and was on the outer ring of the second explosion. So Mr. Tusoma Yamaguchi is the only guy that survived both atomic bomb blasts. He just died a few years ago. The Allies demand unconditional surrender. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be token. You will capitulate. But the surrender in the Asian world is much more different than Europe. It is a sign of dishonor in Japan. So it was difficult to create a formula that both the Allies and the Japanese could live with. The face of defeat was difficult for the Japanese emperor and the people to accept. All right, so there was a plan called the glorious death of the 100 million where they were all going to sacrifice themselves. People were going to be in like neighborhood combat units as death was preferable to surrender. But by 1945, a new prime minister, Admiral Kantoro Suzuki, one of the guys of the old Imperial War Council that ordered the Pearl Harbor invasion, is making plans for final defense while secretly sending out envoys of surrender. And so at July 26th, the same conference in Potsdam, where Truman learns of the bomb, we stick to our guns and say, this is going to be unconditional surrender or us. The big difficulty is, as Americans, we want a democracy. The Japanese wanted us to ensure and guarantee the survival of the 2,000-year-old Japanese monarchy. You've got to do that, or we will not be able to accept surrender. Now, it was the Japanese ambassador in Moscow, in the Soviet Union, that let it be known that the Japanese wanted the war to end. But the emperor has got to be secured. The Soviet Union and Japan were not at war yet, so they could talk about this. So, we know that we bombed Hiroshima on August 6th. On 8th, August 8th and 9th, the Soviets will invade Manchuria and Nagasaki is then bombed. The Japanese see themselves being bombed and now attacked by the Soviet Union. So it is on that day, August 9th, that Suzuki and the Emperor then decide it's best to accept some type of surrender. Getting the word in secret from the Americans that Emperor Hirohito will have his throne protected, he decides to surrender. Um, on August 14th, hardliners in the army try to lead a coup to upstage the emperor, but it was quickly defeated. And just as in Europe, it took you know, people on outlying areas of the combat field to get the word. So it's going to take a while. On August 15th, 
is victory in Japan Day as Hirohito announces surrender. But it will take until September for that to happen. On August 30th, the Marines begin to occupy the mainland of Japan. I'll tell you that story in class if we have time. And on August 31st, Douglas MacArthur arrives to take over. On September 2nd, on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, General Yoshihiro Umeiza um, and Prime Minister Suzuki and former Prime Minister Hideki Tojo, the guy who started it, decide to surrender. Um, the Japanese show up late and they've got to march through this giant column of sailors just staring at them and Douglas MacArthur positioned the ship so they would have to turn their back on Tokyo. It was illegal to turn your back to the emperor, but since they were late, he did it anyway. The surrender ceremony will last 23 minutes. The Japanese were seen as the enemy when they came aboard, and they were saluted upon leaving. Um, I have a great story about Douglas MacArthur, Bull Halsey, and Chester Nimitz, but you guys have to ask me for it. China will get word a week later that Japan surrendered. Burma, um, you know, Myanmar on the 13th, and Hong Kong on the 16th. Japan will become a United States protectorate, and the emperor, who now just become the chief of state, will help with the democratic reconstruction, and him and Douglas MacArthur will strangely become good friends. The war is over. And Yank Magazine has to begin to print articles and help soldiers transition back to civilian life. As many, including Eugene Sledge, are going to have a difficult time in doing so. Here is General Douglas MacArthur, and here is Emperor Hirohito. Um, and that is the ending of the Great World War II. So hopefully you guys got all that. I may do another quick one tomorrow about the firebombing of Japan. But now you've got all the pertinent information for the exam.